Yeah. Guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the show where we get the most interesting folks talking about the future. Today, we got Alex Spinelli on the program. Alex, thanks for coming. My pleasure. So, Alex, I hear you helped Bezos build his evil Alexa empire. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't categorize it as a, an evil empire. Um, but yes, I joined the Alexa team just as it was launching and scaling, and uh, I was responsible for... Um, we call it the Alexa engine is really the core software platform, the brains behind uh, the Alexa experience. What year was that? Um, I've been here for about a year and a half and I was there for about two and a half years. So do the math, 2015, 14, late 14, 15. So you were there at like the kickoff blow up phase where it started to take off. Exactly. So um, they had built uh, this great kind of quirky device uh, and the original team and uh, and then it launched and it was this just wild success. Uh, and I think the folks were like, oh, my God, this actually needs to be a real infrastructure, real technology it needs to do a lot more things. So at the time, I was actually running a search for Amazon. So if you've ever bought or browsed or looked for things across Amazon's websites or mobile apps, I was responsible for uh, for that. Uh, and I took the opportunity to uh, look at the next iteration of uh, consumer experiences, the way we, the way I think many of us, if not all of us, will soon interact with our digital lives is through natural language. Is voice the next search? I don't get stuck in it, be it voice or messaging or gestures or, 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 or AR, VR. My whole view is that um, because of technology limitations over the last 20 years, and, and I was a, a, a person who contributed to this, um, we've kind of wandered away from really having conversations and dialogues with each other. Uh, we've kind of leaned into surfaces. We've got obsessed with surfaces, swiping and tapping and all this kind of stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. How big is the surface? Is it a phone? Is it is it you know horizontal? Is it vertical? Is it a tablet? And those are really terrible experiences. They're actually not very effective for other than entertainment and like watching video. They're not very effective for actually communicating and sharing information. We like to talk to each other. I didn't come to this podcast and just send you a microsite, right, or an app and say, sure. Anything you would ask me, you could search and browse. No, I'm actually having a conversation with you because it's a better way to exchange information. And we're doing it with audio and visual, and there'll be some text and paired up. Um, and that's where technology can uh, can lead us now, is we can actually have real dialogues and conversations, both with each other through digital means, but also with technology, with AI and bots and all these kinds of things. When do you think 25, 50% of digital interactions at least the one-sided ones start to happen via voice? Um, that's a good question. I think we'll start to say, I, I, I don't like predicting like numbers like that, but I think we'll see a pretty large acceleration of our interactions with the digital lives in natural language. Uh, I wouldn't say just voice really accelerate over the next two to three years. Um, we n natural language understanding NLU is now at the place where it is kind of 95, 96, 97 percent accurate, and that gets into a place where um, we as humans feel that it's reliable. If something kind of fails more than one in 20 times, we actually don't think it's reliable. We don't we won't use it consistently. You mean um, so, but once you get into <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, yes. Um, I think when stuff feels reliable, we really start to use it. And again, I don't know if vo it's only voice. I think if you're out on the bus, you're in the subway, you're commuting, you're in a crowded room, you, you want to use messaging. And that's really where we at LivePerson have leaned into for the short term, the next two to three years. We think messaging uh, our digital lives is, is really the future. And we'll definitely get into chatbots and where that's headed. In terms of Amazon and Alexa, I know I, for one, have no level of comfort in putting an Alexa or a Google Home device in my house for the privacy mm. and the the surveillance type economy. What are your thoughts on that? Being someone who is behind the behind enemy lines, so to speak. <laughs> well, um, I can assure you, as the built a lot of the APIs around uh, opening the microphone and doing those kinds of things. Uh, it doesn't listen to all your conversations. It's not streaming stuff to the cloud unless that light is on. It's actually hardware limitations. There is a listening device, local listening for the wake word, but that actually only listens 
just for the wake word and only in your home. Um, I, I'm a little bit of a contrarian there. I'm a, I am a privacy freak. I do take my data and my security very seriously, but to be honest, a microphone in your home, it sounds terrible or, or is the least of your concerns. Everything you do with your credit card, I don't know if you have a price club card when you go to the supermarket, um, when you drive your car, if you have a car that's been built in any of the most recent years, it's actually beaming your you know, data and where you are and, and GPS information up, all anonymized. Um, our data is out there. Our data is everywhere. Our data is being sold constantly. You need to be incredibly vigilant. The thing that you look at that you know when you're speaking to it in your home, to, for me, is the least thing to worry about. It's all the things that you have no idea that are spying on you that you should worry about. How do we and you should that be. spying economy? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think there's going to have to be legislation around uh, data usage and, and, and privacy. I think one of the things that we as consumers need to do is be really vigilant. We need to learn. So I think actually educating each other and ourselves around those other sources of information, not the camera I can see or the microphone that I can see, but the other ones that I can't or I'm not thinking about is important. Um, and there has to be a kind of reclamation or democratization of our data and information. Companies have made billions and billions, if not trillions, on our data. We we take these things readily for free. I mean, I'm I Google, you know, Gmail is something I use for my whole family, and we'll take it readily. Um, so I do think there's a consumer uh, kind of education piece that has to happen. There, there's some interesting startups. I think there's some interesting entrepreneurs starting to think about this problem. How do we put data back into the consumer's hands? I don't have a good answer right now. I think it's going to be a long, hard slog. Um, I get really fascinated with things like cryptocurrencies, not because of a lot of what's spoken about them, but I think the sort of power of my transaction information is back in my hands, and that, I find that pretty fascinating. So I think a lot of it's education these kinds of uh, podcasts. I would kind of agree, but I think a big part of it is the Coke problem. I would love to throw like a 500% tax on Coke because people want it, <laughs> but we know they shouldn't have it. And I think that's, right. I think a lot of what, and if we give it to them, they over time become healthy, less healthy and less healthy, which taxes the entire system, makes them have issues, etc. But you can't force people to do it. And I feel like with privacy, Privacy is dead, but it's not dead in the terms of con of businesses. It's almost dead in terms of consumers. We all know it's a bad thing, and yet we eat the we eat the Oreos anyways. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's interesting. Privacy is not a natural state for any animal, so it is kind of a somewhat socially invented concept that's only been around for a couple of hundred years. Actually, you just go back a little bit in time, and it really didn't exist. The hallways didn't exist. Rooms were kind of open, shared systems. So. It's an interesting, uh, I think, sort of sociological, philosophical conversation to have. Like, are, are we naturally private? I mean, obviously, we like our privacy for certain reasons, and, and some very positive, some nefarious. Um, but it's not like a natural state of an animal. It's not something we naturally – and you look at the way um, younger generations are sort of so readily sharing information and Instagram and social media – um, you could argue that it may, maybe it's unnatural. I don't know. I don't advocate for the destruction of privacy. I just I find the whole journey fascinating. I don't think it matters if it's natural or unnatural. I think what matters long term is if it's dangerous. So pollution is dangerous because over time it creates climate change. Right. Pri privacy, I would argue, would be a similar thing because over time it creates Cambridge Analytica. Right. Well, you could argue... Um, if you carry that forward, privacy also does create danger, right? It allows people who will harm you to hide things. It allows criminals to conduct activities. Uh, you know, pure transparency and pure openness could, in terms of what safety is, uh, enable more. But I guess the p problem becomes like, what's danger? Who defines what is danger? Who defines what is safe? Who defines what is right? Uh, so I think that's where uh, things get a little, like the Coke debate, for example, Somebody has to define what's healthy. So uh, I think we err toward looking at privacy because we can say, well, at least in that regard, I'll, I'll be private because I can define what I believe is healthy or, or safe. Mm -hmm. And if so, you're too private, it can, it can also kill business. So it's, right. it is a complicated fine line. But you've got to be able to have the, the double-sided sword because you, 
It, if you can't be sad, then you can't be happy. You don't really get one. Without the other. <laughs> exactly. 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 So we're moving into this world where we do have new interfaces. Your company's working on chatbots. We see Alexa exploding. This is one of the questions I've been thinking. How close are we to being in the kitchen and saying, hey, Alexa, check my Pinterest. I want all those recipes delivered. Or, hey, Alexa, we're out of this. We're out of that. Start sending it through. I feel like that was obviously Amazon's wild card when they bought Whole Foods was to be able to facilitate that easy purchase. Yeah, so I don't think we're all that far. Those actually, from a pure science perspective, those kinds of uh, experiences are, are, are not super, super hard. Um, I mean, I say that and yet we still, you know, Alexa will get music names wrong and band names wrong. Um, but that's going to improve pretty quickly. Um, I think in terms of just thinking about the consumerization of this technology and groceries, I mean, yes, absolutely. If you're a big business and you're trying to meet consumers' lifestyles, food and clothing are the two biggest things that we spend money on. So it's actually definitely an important part of our lives, though margins from a business perspective are very small. It never ceases to amaze me the next startup that gets a lot of traction that's building the next you know, home delivery for food or prepackaged goods or pre-chopped vegetables and all those kinds of things. Um, it's a very hard market to compete in. Owning it, though, puts you firmly in that customer's workflow. They're kind of daily circuit, right? It's like, this is where I eat, so I'm going to use it for other things. Um, but science-wise, uh, we should be able to deliver those kinds of experiences uh, pretty reliably, I would say, in the next 18 months. The data is there. It's all about collecting data, right? Machine learning and AI is having the data, having uh, the data to feed those al algorithms, to feed those models. One of the things I get worried about with Alexa specifically, my background is e-commerce, Amazon. I sold on Amazon mm -hmm. before selling that business, is the prioritization. You see this in Amazon's marketplace. They prioritize Amazon basics. They're scaling up exponentially those number of products, basically pushing themselves above others. When it comes to voice, you're probably only going to get one option. And that one option is going to be from Mr. Bezos himself, if in any way, shape, or form they can avoid monopoly regulation. Right. Well, I don't know about that. So I, I actually worked on some of the Amazon Choice uh, business uh, model, and um, it's it's actually not necessarily the Amazon thing. So it's not always the Amazon product. It actually is a composite of what people have been buying, ratings, reviews. Are they in stock? And I can say it benefits Amazon. Obviously, they look at they look at you know being able to sell more products. Um, I, I'm sure it happens. It happens in all companies. I never experienced a um, kind of negative consumer initiative. Generally speaking, people there are people like you and me. They actually want to do the right thing. Um, does that collectively create some challenges? Sure. Um, on Alexa, for sure, you're going to have to limit choice. You know, you're not going to show big lists of things or read off big lists of things. So um, I think consumers will have to make informed decisions and form choices about convenience over selection for those kinds of things. How do you think about tech monopolies and Amazon specifically? Well, um, I actually think a lot about these things. Um, I, I find it kind of a fascinating uh, space um, of all. So of the, the retail, the share of online, the share of uh, U.S. retail that's online is still around 16, 17 percent. Amazon owns about half of that. Um, so in terms of all retail, it's like measured in the six, seven percentage. Um, that's nowhere near monopoly or trust kind of size or scale. It's still quite far away. So I think the way you define the industry uh, dictates how you think about monopoly. So Amazon's quite far away. And I think if you look at others um, around sort of online advertising, uh, online media, those are actually get a lot more interesting where there's a, who's disseminating our information. Uh, and you look at sort of Facebook's share of social media, you look at Google's share of online advertising. I think we'd love to go look at Amazon, uh, and I'm not an Amazon defender per se, I'm just telling you what I really think based on my experience. Um, we, we see that uh, uh, where we learn about what's happening in the world comes from very, very few companies. We like to think about, you know, how we spend our money, what we're buying as this dangerous place. But I get more worried about the information space personally. Interesting. Go deeper on that. Um, I mean, just a few companies truly control what you learn, what you know. Um, I think there is danger there. I don't believe today that there are kind of nefarious 
uh, people at work trying deliberately to influence us. I think it can happen. Um, but I think if you really w- look at where do you get your information, where do you learn about what's happening in the world and from how many different sources uh, and how many of those sources are owned by one another, um, I think that's where, for, for me, I think we need to get a little bit more cautious about monopoly and control and those kinds of things and think about competition. Not control, not government control, but you know, encouraging more competition for sure. How do you encourage more competition when you have an aggregation effect? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. I think, uh, you know, there's interesting things when you look at some of the founders of Facebook talking about, you know, breaking up some of the the properties that have been purchased. Um, there may need to be some regulation there. There may need to be some action uh, to actually, you know, forcibly disconnect. And the pendulum always swings. You know, you can look at the Bells and AT&T and how things have swung around and the re- reconsolidation. Um, I think, again, I'll go back to consumer education. You know, consumers, information consumers, product consumers, we have to learn. We have to spend time and understand what's happening. Who controls what? Um, how does information get to us? How do products get to us? What's the supply chain? I'm not sure there's many simple ways around it. Uh, I think a lot of it's on us and it goes back to what we said before, right? But we love the Coke and we love the free information and we love the free email and we love the free communication. Um, maybe we need to start paying, you know, fair value for those things so that we can have more choice. Yeah. The slippery slope to to hell is paved in good intentions. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. I know with Amazon specifically, one of the things that's worrisome is you can, you can very clearly see this. That they basically look for the third party seller selling well and then create the Amazon Basics version. And based off of all the experience, I, I, I ran an Amazon podcast in the past, <laughs> thousands of sellers. You very, yep. very frequently see, oh, let's use this information, find out what sells, and then prioritize this above all else. I feel like you have to split something like that off because if you're playing marketplace and you're playing provider, you're automatically playing two sides, i.e. monopolizing. Yeah, again, interesting debate. You got to look at the market share before you can really talk monopoly, right? So I think that's always the sort of interesting challenge. Um, I think if you look at the number of businesses enabled, also, um, I can now be a small business person in India and and have a global business, which is pretty amazing that I can do that. Um, So there's trade-offs. There's all trade-offs, pros and cons of these things. I think they all should be looked at. uh, I think when you have something as big and as powerful with as big a market cap and as much money that flows through, uh, you need inspection. Consumers need to inspect, governments need to inspect, and Amazon needs to be inspected like any other business. Yeah, they bought whole, they bought Whole Foods for $13 billion and the market caps of the other supermarkets dropped $13 billion. So it uh, they kind of subsidized it for them. It's, uh, I, I feel like those are some of the dynamics that are scary. Why chatbots? For sure. For why, sure. why chatbots? Why'd you get into that? Yeah, so um, we actually think the word chatbot's a little bit of a dirty word. We think they've kind of uh, maybe you know uh, jumped the shark a little bit. Uh, we we actually think about automation, natural communications, and those kinds of things. For me, when I was uh, at Alexa, you know, arguably one of the hottest products on the planet, I had a conversation with Rob Lacasio, the CEO founder here of Live Person, and what really got interesting was. Um, I firmly believe in what I mentioned before that the the paradigm of our user interactions is wrong. Like surfaces is wrong. The best way to communicate is through dialogues and conversations. Businesses were built for thousands of years by building relationships, having dialogues, having conversations. Obviously, Alexa is a big, was a big part of that in terms of influencing me. You see the power there. Um, but what enamored me is the ability to actually come to a smaller company, have a bigger impact as an individual, but also go and actually help the world's biggest brands uh, embrace natural communication, embrace messaging, embrace natural language and dialogues and conversations in the way that they talk to their consumers, not just do it for Amazon. And that's why I joined Live Person. It's not about chatbots. It's about um, helping the companies we use every day in our lives, our banks, our telcos, our insurance companies, our utilities, to actually really progress forward. And I want to have dialogues again. I want to be able to talk to my bank. I mean, it's kind of interesting. Um, I don't know how many banks you use or how many apps you have on your phone, but um, they all look the same. I mean, banks have, uh, that used to be the place you put your money, like that you trusted them. They knew you, right? Uh, They helped you save. They were involved in your life. 
And uh, now a bank is an app and it looks the same as the next bank and they all have their online bill payment. And they, I don't, I, sometimes I don't know, I have five banks I interact with over the course of my life. I have 401ks in some, I have my shared account that my wife and I created, her business account. I don't know which one I'm on. So the reason for me is they, they've, they wandered down this very impersonal path of, of, of the way we've built these surfaces, you know, swipe, type, tap. Um, I want to help businesses return to actually having dialogues, learn who I am, be able to have a personalized discussion, have a conversation. Uh, I think it's a better way to communicate, better way to build a relationship. Yeah, right now, uh, banking is pretty much a, it's a have to have. It's a, it's a pain in the butt. You don't, you don't like it. You wait on the phone for an hour for freaking bank of america but the, at the same time with a lot of the at least the chat based apps i've used it goes one of two ways a lot of times it's like thank god i didn't need to so- talk to someone and the other t- <laughs> the other the other half is like god damn it let me talk to someone because it's like did you mean this or this no i didn't mean either yes. of those so what what how do you blend those things together because for consumers it's either great or it sucks you're never going to hear about it otherwise Yeah, our goal is so that you never have that experience, that you're just desperate to talk to someone. Our goal is to be smart enough where you can solve the problems that we can solve in uh, natural language understanding, in an AI experience, easily and quickly. And if you wander into a problem that you can't, we immediately get to you to a person and we preempt that and we anticipate that. And that's where the magic of the, some of the AI and machine learning we're building is, is really understanding what the next best action, the next best thing to do is. And often that is, let me get this person to a human. Like we'll actually detect sentiment declining. We'll actually detect tone declining and changing. We'll try to detect different what we call intents so in natural language understanding when you ask for something you're expressing an intent so the science terminology is the intent can we detect the intent along the way and make sure if it's an easy one reset my password change an address check an order status all those things easy um, we can do that in an automations it's fast it's simple you didn't wait for anyone but if it's hey i really don't understand this charge on my bill Um, that's going to be hard for AI to actually help you through. Let's get you to a person and the right person immediately. So we work really hard to make that experience, you know, clean and seamless. Are we, you know, is it hundred percent? No, you know, we, we still have uh, work to do. Um, but our goal is you walk away from that experience like that. That was smart. That was easy. That was intuitive. And when I needed help, I can get it from a human being. So we're actually trying to augment that human experience. Augment, but also make more efficient so some of it will be automate do you think automation as we move forward is net positive or net negative for total number of jobs yeah so that's a a really interesting uh area to talk through so um i think more and more of our lives will become digital right uh and automation is the only way to scale those things we're now just in the u.s you know four percent uh employment rate um, how do we actually continue to scale our services? How do we actually do more for customers? How do we be more available for customers in real time, anytime? Um, there just actually aren't enough humans. So we actually have to automate. I believe automation actually is a net positive. It actually allows you as a you know, information worker, even an agent, to actually go and focus on the harder problems and and focus on them faster. So for our view is we help an enterprise automate. We help their agents be far more efficient. And we don't actually focus on, oh, you can let go of 10,000 workers. We actually say you can now scale your customer base in an unlimited manner to help with all the simple, easy problems that AI and automation can do very easily. And your agents can go and solve the harder and more fulfilling problems. And your customers will wait on hold zero. They won't wait on hold at all. And it actually creates a competitive advantage. And what we say is we'll see customers that embrace us, either with us or with other solutions, that you will prefer doing business with a with an enterprise, with a small business that you can get instant help, immediate help. You can get to a human when you need a human immediately, and that person is trained and knowledgeable in their product offering. And the businesses where you're going to wait, you're just not going to go to. So we actually think, at least for the foreseeable future, right now, next three, five years, um, automation is definitely a net positive. Now, you know, we can put on all our futurist hats and look 
forward and say how many, you know, how how advanced will AI really get in terms of putting us out of work? I don't know. I don't know. I think it'll be really smart. We'll be able to do those recipe uh, use cases that you mentioned. But again, Alexa and others still get song names wrong and still get words wrong when you're trying to text someone. So we're a little bit further away from that kind of all singing, all dancing, you know, full automation. Would, so I'm I'm bullish on it. I'm pretty excited about it. I would agree with some of that. I would say humans also make those same errors, though. And <laughs> if we're getting to the point where you get the the same level, basically, I would agree with most all of what you said, other than increased efficiency leads to more jobs because ultimately we can't have consumers consuming a hundred times what they're consuming today. So there's just going to be less users needed to handle the customer service less jobs in customer service. I feel like you could wave that around a lot of the economy and that we will see those type of trends because consumption can't go up that much. I don't know. I mean, jobs change. I mean, I think this conversation could have been had a hundred years ago with any machine coming out and say, oh, it's going to eliminate jobs. Uh, it didn't. We found more. Uh, the population has continued to you know, rise at a pretty dramatic rate. I think it will continue to rise at a pretty... Uh, high rate. Um, I I see us creating new jobs. I see us finding new ways for humans to help and interact. I see us being able to do new uh, and exciting things. I'm less scared about it. There's going to be pitfalls. There's going to be dangerous parts, no doubt. I'm not naive to that. There's going to be some bumps along the way. But the net net, I think, um, productivity uh, is you know sort of the number one driver in progress in all economic growth. If you studied it for thousands of years, so um, I'm pretty I'm pretty hopeful, uh, cautiously, uh, knowing that you know we'll have some pain along the way for sure. You're in Seattle. What are your thoughts on income inequality and how it's been growing? <laughs> yeah, um, pretty pretty uh, visible here. I think in Seattle uh, at times, um, I think that disparity is a is a big deal. Uh, I don't know if, uh, I have a solution to that. Um, I think, you know, more and more it's something, again, I go back to uh, educating people about the facts and the data, um, so that we can vote, uh, in the right way. We can look at, you know, how we want to distribute, uh, income and taxes and those kinds of things. I think it's a, it's a big problem. Um, I often tell engineers I'm hiring, you know, this, the, the, what we're getting paid is, uh, you know, it's funny money to some folks and it, the party's not going to last forever. And we actually have to think about being really responsible and returning some of that to our communities. And I think that's important for anyone in a position of, you know, economic growth, uh, to think really deeply about how we return some of that to the communities. So tough problem. Uh, yeah, I don't know if we want to make this a political uh, <laughs> podcast. We'll go, we'll go for but it. We're, we're, go no, for it. we're mean, playing I'll, Monopoly. I'll, I'll I think some balanced. of that is I mean, valuable. A, yeah, no, I think it's a, I think it's a tough problem. I think we have to, you know, think hard about where we put our our votes. And um, I I think the number one challenge there is you know, helping people be informed about how that 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 distribution is expanding. Right, the haves certainly have more, and the have-nots are are having less and less. Um, so how do we look at that? I, again, I'll go back to maybe I'm overly optimistic. Uh, I actually think technology, AI, machine learning, I think these things can actually help us um, eliminate a lot of the sort of menial work that's still required in many, many, many industries and encourage us to think about how we train and educate and look to human beings to actually do uh, the thought work, right, and uh, and actually lean into what we're really good at. Uh, and I actually look for us to sort of uh, expand those 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 uh, as places. What we're doing, actually, and again, not that th- this is just an honest view, not not to promote us. We actually um, have a, a set of programs around training agents how to think about designing conversations, right? So we actually have found, and, and this is a you know, true story, we've created new types of roles and new type of jobs for people uh, in far-flung places around the world as they help think about how do you automate this use case? You, your, your business is only 2 or 3% online. These are massive uh, retail businesses that still only have 2 to 3% of their sales online. How do we actually shift that more so that you get more reach? And we're actually leaning on um, customer service agents in 
you know, what, what people would call, you know, second world, third world countries and educating them and training them because they are the best at understanding how consumers have conversations and interact with the enterprise. Uh, and we've created new roles and new jobs with dramatic income changes. So I'm pretty hopeful. I do think that technology and productivity and these capabilities are helpful tools. Again, there's downsides, there's danger. We have to be vigilant there, but I'm pretty hopeful that that is part of the answer. I think, you know, lots of, it's a complex problem, lots of things that have to come together. Um, but I'm pretty hopeful that um, I can play a part there. And I do think these tools are helpful. What sci-fi book or movie are we most moving towards in your opinion? <laughs> well, in my hopeful short term term, I, I'm a little less hopeful way, way long term sometimes. I can get a little dark. Um, I actually am a big Ian Banks fan. Uh, the Culture, I don't know if you've read anything by him. Uh, I do think this sort of progression to kind of a post-labor uh, future is it's far out, uh, but I do believe that um, you know machines and technology will get smarter and smarter. I do think we'll figure out how to protect ourselves. I don't think uh, I don't subscribe to Musk's fear, uh, and I do think we will have a world in which um, we can kind of think about our lives beyond labor, beyond work, and focus on arts and community. Uh, so I would say some of the some of the both on the dark side and the more positive side, the work of Ian Banks. How do you think about that in terms of is it post money? Is it UBI? When does something like this? I know you don't like making predictions, but make a prediction based off of a condition. Yeah, I definitely think it's a post money, post labor. Uh, is that 200, 300 years out? I'm not sure, but it's it's in that kind of horizon. Okay, so you think it's that far out. What uh, what are the most valuable yeah. things you'll well, learn? Machines won't be smart enough for them until then. True. Perhaps taking human beings amplified by machines may change that dynamic, though. Maybe. What was the most valuable things you learned working at Amazon? Oh, so much. Uh, uh, as you can tell, I'm kind of a fan. Uh, again, it's got its downsides, but um, I'm, I had a pretty nice experience. I didn't, uh, you know, of course, I, I, I believe some of the negative experiences. I didn't see that personally. Um, I think it's commitment to the consumer. Like it really does every day make decisions that are not good business decisions in favor of improving the consumer experience. Now it does believe long term that's a good business decision, but in the short term they do it every day. So I think that sort of maniacal focus on the customer. I think a commitment for truth finding. Uh, so there's kind of interesting story. I don't know if it's a Jeff story or not around, you know, two people negotiating or deciding they wanted to put some furniture in a house, uh, the floor to ceiling shelving. And there was a debate, is it nine feet tall or is it 10 feet tall? And lots of companies and lots of places would compromise, uh, call it nine and a half. Well, you're going to end up with something that doesn't go to the ceiling or doesn't fit. So there's a, a pursuit of what's the truth, get out and measure. Uh, and that's something I've taken with me. Um, and uh, the doc writing culture, like trying to, you know, that all those things that people talk about around, you know, meetings being a document that people read quietly for the first 20 minutes are true. Uh, and I, I have actually carried that here to live person. We write things down in prose with data and information and we read and share together. Uh, and I think it drives a different type of rigor in thinking through problems. Um, so, you know, lo lots of stuff. Um, it's, like I said, it's got its... Downsides, I think um, sometimes it does focus too much on the data and too much on their process and mechanisms. Um, I think it uh, can create, you know, they definitely be decentralized teams all kind of pursuing their own goals. And I agree in principle, but it can create some competitiveness. Maybe that's not always healthy. So I do think uh, a little bit more collaboration and and kind of deliberate kindness uh, is important as a principle. They don't have like an anti-kindness principle, but it's not an overarching principle. Uh, teamwork is not one of their, their core principles. Again, it's not anti-teamwork, but it, I think if you know what you don't focus on, you don't make a priority as a leader because is not a priority of the team. Um, but no, I think it's, it's a, it's a, it's a interesting place to work that can help you be work harder and smarter in, in pretty new ways. What did you think about the HQ2 zoo and the, <laughs> the whole bending over backwards for corporate tax breaks that a lot yeah. of areas give out? It was certainly a zoo. 
uh, I find it. Uh, I I often scratch my head at uh, what cities are willing to do uh, and how. I actually think if if cities put the kind of time and effort that Amazon puts into making decisions around data and and being data driven and and c- customer focused in terms of their local population, you probably wouldn't have seen the same cities. Uh, offer as much to Amazon. Some can afford it. New York is probably a place that it would have been a, a, a pretty good benefit. There are probably others that that wouldn't have uh, been as smart to afford it. Um, I don't know. Tax breaks for big, very wealthy companies are kind of an interesting conundrum. Uh, you got to get into the data. Are they real? Will the benefit really be re- recognized by the local population? I think sometimes yes, sometimes no. Hard to say in this situation. It was a zoo. I feel like it was already decided ahead of time. New York, Washington, D.C. You want to have the rich politicians stuck in your pocket in terms of they have the they have the jobs and we're bringing them here. Same thing with New York, the second big powerhouse. Yeah, I can say I know people that live in that area. Uh, it would have been a pretty big boon for that area, the, the Long Island City. It's kind of a... Apparently, they're building up pretty quickly already. They're already scaling up faster than they intended to in terms of employees. They were they had five six thousand people in New York already, so that's kind of an interest. Yeah, yeah, maybe uh, maybe you didn't need the tax breaks and they'll come anyways. It's uh, it's an <laughs> it's an interesting conundrum, so to speak. I agree, I agree. What topic or trend are you most excited about today, and why? Let's say outside of your own work. Hmm. Um. That's interesting. I have become very enamored with uh, community projects, community art, community uh, communities coming together to sort of think about the experience. How do we get more hyper local? Um, so I find, uh, and I haven't found that any individual startup or company that's kind of really, really kind of lit a fire for me in terms of wanting to to, to get involved in some way. Um, but that whole trend, sort of the idea of hyper-local, uh, community-driven efforts, uh, organic efforts, I find uh, pretty fascinating. And it's an area that uh, over the next year I'm going to spend more time on thinking about. How do we promote better corporate citizenship? That's If we're going to have another ding, that's something I've heard on Amazon. Is It's not great on that. Yeah. Um, I really, throughout my whole career and life, have gone back and forth on sort of regulation and more free markets, and um, I'm probably somewhere in the middle at this point, but um, the main area, I think, does, I don't, you know, I don't subscribe to some of the, the more extreme uh, measures being uh, kind of bantied around uh, during this election, but um I, I actually think none of it works unless consumers get educated and uh, drive the kinds of things that they want to see. So um, I f- have found if you just go through history, if you, you look at when consumers get energized about something, boycotts, when consumer demand changes and shifts, uh, companies tend to listen. Um, I, I, I think you know, how we help and educate consumers about what's happening is, is critical. It's something we try to do a lot here uh, as we kind of move forward with experiences for consumers for the enterprise is we're always sort of transparent about um, what we're doing. We're always transparent that this is an automation, this is a bot. Obviously, this is not corporate citizenship, um, but transparency is important. I think there probably needs to be some regulation to sort of dramatically increase the transparency of how things come together, inputs, uh, our supply chain, those kinds of things would be uh, a path I would explore. I like that you brought up transparency. There's the Twitter bots and there's Google duplex. Tackle them. Yeah. So uh, I, uh, we believe very firmly in being transparent when you're speaking to an AI uh, or a bot. Uh, it's always, uh, we actually won't allow our, our customers to uh, pretend to be humans. Um, interestingly, sometimes we get, some folks asking to pretend to be bots, which is kind of interesting. Uh, sounds counterintuitive, but kind of interesting. Um, there, there will be, I, I don't even want to say, there will be regulation that uh, enforces uh, reflecting when, when you're speaking to a, an AI or not a human. There must be and there will be. So that's a prediction I'll give you. Uh, and I think there actually fakes? is already stuff. Sorry? Deep fakes? Yeah, that is an interesting one. I 
I think, again, there needs to be transparency around it. Uh, I wouldn't regulate against it, though. If there's transparency around it, what's the point of doing it? Um, I, I, I think you can ask that question about a lot of types of entertainment. So I don't know. What's the point of a lot of things? Um, I think it's uh, you're going to have the ability to make movies, right, where you're allowing your actors to do things that they really physically could never do. Um, that's interesting. Um, and I'm not sure it would necessarily take away from the enjoyment for most people, given how much CGI there is today. So I think there's a point. Um, if you're really trying to fool somebody, there's no point if it's transparent, obviously. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would say it would pretty much die except for like the porn industry. If you have regulations like that, that would be the only place it would still <laughs> go. But in terms of most of what I don't know, Thanos do, was pretty much a deep fake. I mean, the entire movie, uh, I mean, what are you really seeing of him? A little bit of a facial expression and it, I, if I were him, he could have sat back and said, sure, take it from there. Uh, and I, I'm not sure anyone would have been less entertained. Okay. I guess we, I guess we have different definitions of deep fake. <laughs> deep fake for me is imitating someone else, but yeah, I think no, no, I get it. I get it. Mm -hmm. What, uh, what technology are you most interested in terms of recent things you've seen day to day? Say that one more time. What's the most interesting thing you've seen in the last week? Uh, it's, you know, it's funny. I've been looking at um, things a little bit beyond technology and uh, I, I've been pretty fascinated at some of the, the ability to create art with technology. So um, I've seen some really neat tools for creating music um, where an individual can really uh, do some pretty fascinating things at incredible fidelity. And uh, a friend of mine was showing me some of that recently and I, I got pretty interested in it. Um, I think the miniaturization of uh, uh, electronic components uh, is super, super interesting to me. Again, I'm, I've been looking at a lot of art and, and those kinds of things. So the ability to kind of uh, what you can do with LED and lights and put intelligence into very, very small spaces, I find uh, really fascinating. Um, so that's an area just outside of the AI and machine learning work that I'm doing here that I've, I've gotten pretty enamored with. One last thing before we jump to the lightning round, and that's IoT. What do you see the role in terms of sensors and then voice computing, so to speak, playing into the smart home wearables, the future of that market? Where do you see us headed? Yeah, so that is where I'm most uh, worried about uh, something really falling down. So um, everything, I'll, I'll make some predictions here, everything will be smart in the next 10 years. Um, uh, anything you can look at, we're going to put some kind of a sensor or a device in a location tracker, uh, something I think humans, we there is no way we don't, especially as the, it's kind of the cost gets lower and lower and lower. I mean, we can print these things almost in ink now. Um, so I do think we will be uh, you know, surrounded by sensors and intelligent objects and things. Uh, so they will make life incredibly convenient. You'll be able to turn things on from a distance. You'll be able to do gestures. Actually, Google has got some really neat technology where you're turning things in the air and there's a sensor across the room. So you're turning the volume up this way. We actually at Alexa were experimenting with just with my hand like this from across the room. I can increase the volume. So um, – I don't think that's so far away. I think it's kind of an inevitable uh, track. Uh, I know lots of entrepreneurs exploring many, many things there. Um, I worry that um, security is going to be an afterthought for those pieces. And I would predict we will see some, unfortunately, and I'm not trying to have schadenfreude, um, some pretty terrible things happen where hackers – uh, terrorists and those kinds of things end up taking over spaces and, and, and things uh, in ways that uh, can be pretty damaging. So I think we need to be very, very cautious and careful there. But I'm not sure. I think that cat is, is uh, or train is whatever cliche you want to use. Uh, that's going to be, it's well on the way. Uh, there are people in startups building some really neat, really little things, devices, sensors, intelligence lighting uh that uh, are actually going to really blow us away in the next five years yeah we already see hackers like holding baltimore 
ransom. What do we do? Do we need regulation for that? Because it seems like in tech, Equifax hired an art major as their as their uh, <laughs> security officer. That we need to have people accountable somehow, but how? Yeah, I don't. I don't know. Uh, I've thought about actually had debates about this with with some ethics folks. I don't even know what the regulation is uh, there. Um, I think it's going to be very hard. Um, I think there can be regulation around privacy, data usage, those kinds of things. I think there's going to be policies and standards around security and and those kinds of things. Um, but I see because of the complexity, you know, you think of these, these things as mesh, you know, as just any room in your a thousand devices. I mean, I, I forget the number. I was astounded by how many kind of quote unquote computers are in a modern car today. It was like multiple hundreds. Um, it's just incredibly complex and, uh, you know, knowing what's happening, how the data is flowing is going to be very hard to keep pace with. So, um, I think regulation to really be effective would have to be extraordinarily, uh, tight and I'm not sure that's the right thing. So again, I, I sound like a broken record. I think it goes back to transparent, definitely regulation around transparency, communication, uh, standards, what, what's happening, where my data is. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and then, you know, consumer education. And I think we're going to have to be much, much smarter consumers with that stuff, but bad stuff will happen based on those technologies. I'm not, I'm not trying to throw my hands up in the air, but I don't know how to prevent it. I I, I, I keep thinking about it. it, Yeah. Yeah. Someone's getting their Tesla driven off the road. Someone's going to not be allowed into their house. We're going to have some issues. We are. Let's do lightning round. Sound good? Sure. And listeners, if you're getting an ad here, that means you should be supporting us instead. Disruptors.fm slash Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Should I have asked you about that? I didn't. Hmm. Um, I don't know. It's been a pretty wide ranging discussion. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I think, um, you know, certainly, uh, I mean, one of the ones we often get is, you know, who our competitors are, right? how are we building our business? Uh, you were focused a lot more on the technology piece, uh, and more sort of provocative topics. Uh, so that's one typically, I think that interviewers, uh, ask, um, how effective is what we're doing? Something you didn't you didn't ask. So yeah, how, how uh, effective that, is it in terms of how much of customer service can be automated these days? Yeah, so um, we think quite a bit. So we actually see um, when we what we've done is when you call some of our customers, um, you will get a message that says, "Hey, instead of waiting on hold, you can actually." Uh, get a message and and have this conversation in messaging or WhatsApp if if you have WhatsApp. Uh, we see in about four or five weeks a thirty uh, percent up take up in that option. So there's this incredible latent demand for people to not wait on hold. I mean, it sounds obvious when you say it, uh, and actually have a conversation through 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 messaging. It's on their own time. It's asynchronous, so they don't have to you know have the conversation in real time. They have a history of it. They can go back and they can look at it. You can actually send visuals. So it's a pretty powerful experience. Um, we see upwards of, you know, 40, 50, 60% of those conversations, uh, of, of, of con- customer contacts moving toward, um, natural language or messaging conversations, at least in the next three to three to five years. We actually see some in the next year. Um, interestingly, CSAT goes up, NPS goes up and agent sat goes up because the agents are dealing with, we will automate a lot of conversations. Agents get to one, they don't get yelled at on the phone, uh, which is pretty basic, but also they, um, they can handle many more conversations at the same time with less stress because it's, they're asynchronous. Sometimes I'm having a messaging conversation every, I'm turned every minute. Sometimes I'm in this interview and I've left one open and agent can get back to me in 20 minutes. Um, and with automation, agents are actually fielding the more difficult uh, conversation, not password reset, change my address, what's my order status, those kinds of things. So it's been pretty effective, um, but it's a pretty big change for how you run your operation internally. Um, it's not one call, one agent. Um, you actually have to go and integrate with different systems, your e-commerce systems, your back-end systems. So there's work. It's not just super fast plug and play. Some parts are, but some parts require work. Um, but it's 
astoundingly effective. And I think um, you'll see more and more and more of this taking shape over the next really 18 months is because our business is, is booming almost like a startup at this point, which is pretty fascinating for a 20 year old company. I think the reason you don't see it as accelerating in the last couple of years is because we are working with some of the most legacy parts of a business, our contact center, right? It's on prem, big infrastructure, old school systems um, that require a lot of change. Uh, so it takes some time. Will voice computing be a winner takes most? Will it be Alexa? Will it be Google Home, someone else, or is it going to be a mixture? Yeah, I look at Alexa, Google Home, Siri kind of as an outlier, really as the next consumer OS. And I think they look at it similarly. They don't, uh, the way Windows or, or Chrome or Internet Explorer, Firefox, whatever you had, whatever your window to the world was, uh, as kind of the kind of quote unquote operating system or gateway, that's the way um, Google and, and and Amazon look at those experiences. Uh, and um, so I don't know if it's a winner take all. Uh, I think it'll be a winner take a lot, and there'll be a few uh, competing uh, experiences, and there'll be one that's pretty dominant. Um, and then you know that'll be five or six years, and then there'll be the next one. Uh, I think it's a pretty common cycle. I I, I look at the voice wars. It's a very, very similar uh, uh, kind of arc as the browser wars. It's very similar. You don't think data and AI superiority will play a role? Um, I think it did then too. I mean, if you look at Chrome and what Chrome now does, uh, that's because of data and, and, and machine learning and AI and you know, Gmail and being logged in and access to all those kinds of things combined with search. So I think, yeah, no, absolutely. It creates a moat. Uh, I mean, those companies wouldn't want to have it described as a moat, but it definitely does create uh, a moat. Um, and then there'll be the next iteration of that. But I look at them as the window. Uh, and uh, like I said, we're going to be building applications in those uh, just the way we did with the browser. If you had to bet half your money on a public company and half your money on your private company, not your own, what would you bet on? Uh, I'd, I'd be pretty long Amazon. Uh, again, my main metric is the sort of total share of, of retail sales that's as online. Uh, the U S is still 16%. Uh, if you go to Europe, it's under 10. If you go to Australia, Japan, it's kind of under, under sing, it's still in single digits. They got a long, long, long ramp. If they did nothing and just maintain market share, uh, as more f people came into the digital world, their business would still grow at nearly similar rates. So I'd go long on Amazon. I'm very enamored by um, real world meets AI. So of course I'd bet on, on life person, but uh, excluding that, like you said, um, real world meets it. There's some really cool companies, one called Bright Machines, uh, which is building AI driven uh, robots for manufacturing. Uh, today manufacturing, even with robots, is still a very manual, tedious calibration and configuration process. So there's some really neat stuff going on to bring AI into the real world. So check out Bright Machines. You heard it here first, and it is not investment advice, guys. Now, before you tell people where to find you, where to check you out, if you could leave people with one thing, a quote, a call to action, what would it be and why? Uh, your website doesn't work. Shut it down. Think about dialogues and conversations to build real relationships with your consumers. I like it. And your website definitely doesn't work without Amazon because they're hosting pretty much all of it. <laughs> they they, they got to spin there AWS out. That's that's how they avoid some of this regulation stuff and make a bunch of money. I would in the tend process. to agree. I would I would tend to agree with that. Yes. Alex, thanks for coming on. Where can people find you and learn more about you and your robot overlords? Uh, I mean, LivePerson.com will have everything about us and and me and our latest press. So that's a great great starting point. And if you have an Alexa in your home, he's listening. <laughs> thanks for coming on today I you. alex <laughs> i hear you that was a good pun that was a very good one i like when you've got a sense of humor guys thanks for tuning in if you have enjoyed this make sure you subscribe to the disruptors disruptors.fm you can find us on all the major podcasting platforms and share it around with a friend it's the biggest high five you can give us and it helps us grow this and make people like alex said a little more educated and in the know when it comes to tech in the future thanks cheers thank you thank you